Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining CNBC. My I pleasure. want to kick off by asking you about your trip here to the World Economic Forum. You had the chance to sit down with President Trump. Walk me through how likely you think it is that the U.S. president can be of use in terms of cashmere. Uh, look, I can't say uh, I can't say what will be the outcome, but for me, it is important to try my best because Kashmir is, you know, it's a far more serious problem than people realize, the world realizes. Uh, the problem is that India has been taken over by an extremist ideology, which is called Hindutva or, or uh, the RSS. RSS, if you Google RSS founding fathers, they were inspired by the, by the Nazis. They admired the Nazis. They, they admired their racial pur purity. They sort of, they believed in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims. Some of the, uh, found, one of the founding fathers, Gowalkar, he's written about it. So therefore, that ideology that had assassinated Mahatma Gandhi and was declared a terrorist organization three times has taken over India. And Kashmir is just what they have done in Kashmir is, since 5th August, they basically put 8 million people under curfew, uh, under siege. They whisked away all their political leaders. They picked up uh, teenagers, thousands of teenagers taken out of um, Kashmir. So it's a serious situation. And why do I say it's serious? Because I, I worry that this will now spill over. Already the army chief has given a statement that the Pakistan side of uh, Kashmir also belongs to India. So this is serious because there are two nuclear armed countries. That's why I want President Trump head of the most powerful country in the world, he should intervene right now. Uh, uh, United Nations or, or President Trump through the UN, at least the, this is what the world bodies came about after 1945 to stop this sort of a future conflict. Do you believe that Prime Minister Modi is enabling this? Prime Minister Modi was a, a life member of RSS. I repeat, RSS is an extremist ideology. Why do I say that it's important that people in the West, they do not understand this as yet. But if you, if you all you have to do is Google this, this ideology, you will know what it is. So the danger is that it's a country of 1.3 billion people nuclear armed, taken over by this. So it's a nightmare scenario for people like us who are the neighbors. And because of the Kashmir dispute, this could actually uh, spill over. What kind of pressure do you want the international community to put on India? Are we talking about sanctions? What, what would the international community do in similar circumstances? They are all uh, uh, in the United Nations, the Security Council. There are va various ways they can uh, be, be a deterrent, stop this sort of nonsense. And what is, what's happening in India? They passed these two legislation, and these two legis legislations have alarmed the 200 million Muslims living in India. <clears throat> there are already protests going on. In fact, non-Muslims have also joined them. Uh, minorities have joined them. Indian intellectuals have joined them because they realize where this is headed. I mean, the Nazi Germany between 1930 and 1934 turned from a liberal democracy to a fascist totalitarian racist state. This is what's happening in India. When you think about this more broadly, we're talking about an international appeal here as well. I mean, think about the situation in China with the Uyghurs. The international community has really not done enough by a long haul. Does that concern you that a similar situation could take place in India? In India they already, I mean, they, they've got this registration act. Uh, and in Assam, uh, they suddenly deregistered uh, uh, almost 2 million people. Now, 2 million people out of them, they were Hindus, so they brought this other act along. Do you which, think we're talking about a genocide, potentially? In Kashmir, I'm scared, because in Kashmir, they have already, the stated aim of this RSS is that they will change the demography of people of Kashmir. Kashmir is a disputed territory between Pakistan and India. There are 10 or 11 United Nations resolutions which confirm that it's a dispute, and the people of Kashmir, through a referendum, could decide whichever country they wanted to join. Now, uh, that disputed territory has been annexed by India. 
and they are trying to change the demography of people of Kashmir, which according to the fourth Geneva Convention is a war crime. When you think about what happens next, more broadly in this region, beyond Kashmir, there's a lot of concern that we've heard over the last couple of weeks, a lot of it inside the Beltway in Washington and even in the region, that the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign is destabilizing the Middle East or making it more um, worrisome, I would say, between neighbors. Do you think that the U.S. and President Trump is getting it right when it comes to dealing with Iran? Because I know that you've tried to be a mediator in that situation. You see, it would be a disaster if uh, this conflict takes pl place between the U.S. And but he doesn't Trump. seem to want it, President Trump. You know, he keeps backing away. He says that he wants dialogue. Do you think he does? And that's sensible. Um, I mean, just look at Afghanistan. It's almost now 19 years. They're still, we're still finding a solution, still trying to get peace talks going, ceasefire going. Still people are dying in Afghanistan. This is 19 years, over a trillion dollars spent on it. Does the U.S. want another conflict? And trust me, Iran will be much, much more difficult conflict than even Afghanistan. You've spent time in Tehran talking about these issues. Do you believe that there is a possibility that they would sit down with Donald Trump and have a conversation? You know, they, they should, they should, people should never rely on military solutions. I mean, you go, you use military to solve one problem, five other problems come up, unintended consequences. Whenever you look back, look at, look at Vietnam War. You, the generals were saying it's only a few months, two months, six months, six weeks, and look what happened. Same with Afghanistan. I heard it myself. Our own President Musharraf, when he, when we, when he was uh, joining the U.S. war on terror, he said it'll be only a few weeks, or max two, three months. Look, so war is never a solution. People who try and solve issues through bloodshed and war, you know, they they always cause mayhem in this world. A conflict right now with Iran would be a disaster for developing countries. Oil prices will shoot up. Countries like us who are just about balancing our budgets, everything will go and it'll just cause poverty. So I would, you know, and I, I did say it uh, to Pres uh, President Trump that, you know, this is, war is not the solution. Do you think that Tehran would be open to talking to President Trump? When, when I spoke, when I, uh, I spoke to President Trump when I was in the U.S. Uh, in September, then I went to Tehran, spoke to the president and uh, their, uh, their supreme leader. I thought they were receptive. I thought they wanted to, uh, you know, they were willing to talk. When you think about your role as the prime minister, um, there seems to be, and you correct me if I'm wrong, a bit of an edge for celebrity politicians like yourself and even Donald Trump when it comes to communicating, when it comes to opening those doors and having those kinds of conversations. Do you see yourself as a mediator, prime minister? You see, uh, I again repeat, I do not believe in military solutions. This is a, you know, I'm a student of history. Uh, and um, I just have, if look back in history, every time, you know, these military solutions took place, look at Napoleon going into Russia, then Hitler going into Russia. Just look at all these conflicts. Uh, for a start, they're always a miscalculation. They're always a miscalculation. And then they cause bloodshed on this earth. So I look upon myself as someone who would always want to be a partner in peace. We joined, the, we, twice we joined the U.S. sort of uh, camp. One was when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in the 80s. Then we again joined the U.S. after 9-11. Pakistan suffered. I know the consequences. Second time, 70,000 Pakistanis were killed in an in insane war. And we lost over $100 billion to the economy. we just about recovering from it. So uh, from, I'm convinced that people looking for solutions, the only people who benefit is this industrial military complex. When you think about, as well, um, the relationship that you have with President Trump, you have a good relationship with the president. Uh, the relations, however, between the security services between Pakistan and the United States has suffered over the last several years, no doubt, over the last several decades. What's it going to take 
to build that kind of trust back. You see, why did this uh, relationship suffer between uh, the Pakistan security forces and the U.S.? Because I objected, I did not want Pakistan to become part of this war on terror after 9-11 because Pakistan had nothing to do with 9-11. There was no Pakistani involved. Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. And I felt, you know, why were we going into this war? Um, when we went into the war, as time passed, initially there was this romance with General Musharraf because he was fighting America's war. After a while, when Musharraf could not deliver what the Americans wanted, and he could not deliver, he should never have promised them that he could deliver what, what was beyond him. He could not win America the war in Afghanistan. No one could. But they, were, they kept asking Musharraf to do more, and he kept promising them more, but he couldn't deliver. So that's where the mistrust began. This time, it is based on uh, trust common objectives. This time it is based on the fact that I always believed that there was no military solution in Afghanistan. And so does President Trump. So now both of us can work for the peace process and we are trying our best. It's not easy because it's 19 years of this turmoil that has taken place in Afghanistan. But it is the only way. Somehow the Taliban and the Afghan government, they get together and work out some sort of a political settlement. It is the only way. Does it worry you that there are such radically different ideologies when it comes to women, when it comes to human rights, the Taliban versus the Afghan government? I was just sitting with Ashraf Ghani earlier today and talking about this. He was talking about the potential for peace uh, with the Taliban. It seemed to echo your statements as well. But in terms of what it means for women in that country, does that worry you? You see, you see I think, you know, in the Afghan culture, actually it's a very democratic culture. And once they get together, I think they'll work it out. It's not the Taliban of 2001. So much has water has gone under the bridge. Uh, so little girls will be going to school, you think? I think so. I think that uh, it won't, you will not find them the way they were in 2001. The circumstances were different. There was that civil war that had taken place. The rape of Kabul has, had taken place by one of the warlords. It's not exactly, it's not the same situation now. But I feel that the Afghans are democratically minded people. They will sit on the table. They'll thrash it out. What happens next for Pakistan with regards to the economy? Because you've been able to work with allies in the region, as well as the IMF, the United States, in terms of trying to give Pakistan a leg up and get back to the game. Where are we today? Well, you know, we inherited a, a bankrupt uh, and indebted economy. Uh, with a huge uh, fiscal and, and uh, current account deficit. And it has been a very difficult year, really, to, uh, uh, to stabilize the economy. The, the, our, rupee, our currency lost value, but fortunately it's stabilized and without any government support it's found its market value. And as a result, the, the uh, market sentiment has gone up. Our stock market is now the highest in one year. We've uh, a foreign investment, direct investment, has risen 200% in one year. So th we are moving in the right direction. And we are moving now towards an export-led growth rather than a consumption-led growth or an import-led growth, which, which is why we had this imbalance and hence go to the IMF for help. This is, we sort of, difficult structural reforms, but it is the only way to get out of this boom and bust syndrome, which is which has been plaguing us for 30 years. And I feel that we are on the right track. Now, the only thing is people are hurting because of you know, all the measures we've taken. Now we want uh, to concentrate on growth, creating jobs for the people. One of the criticisms that I've heard here at the World Economic Forum, speaking to various business leaders about doing business in Pakistan, you went on uh, quite um, a raid, in a sense, of the business elite in Pakistan. And you held them very much to account um, for what a lot of people thought was uh, cornering the market and corruption. And you're known for that. But when business leaders externally look at that and say, you know, this is an incredible opportunity to make money and to grow and even to create jobs. But at the same point, we don't know that we have the assurance of the government that their policies aren't going to change. What's your message my, to them about doing business in Pakistan? The, my, the, the people who I held responsible were always the political elite. You see, if the political elite 
uh, is clean, then you know they will not have crony capitalism. Problem that happened in Pakistan was that we had these two uh, political houses, and both just competed in in siphoning of money out of the country, money laundering. And once the leadership does that, then the whole system falls apart. So it is not the business community I b- blamed. In fact, this is the first government which has gone out of its way to promote industrialization in Pakistan since the 60s. In 60s, Pakistan government actively pr- promoted industrialization. We, are, we were the fastest growing economy. And then we lost our way with nationalization. Socialist, socialist government came along. And then for some of that mindset never changed. Uh, making money was considered a crime almost. Now we have we encourage businesses, industry. We are doing everything possible so that people can make profits. So once you make profits, then it becomes like uh, honey for bees to come, investors to invest. So uh, this is now actively a government trying to create wealth in the country by promoting industrialization. Security. That's a big red flag even today for folks who think about putting their businesses in Pakistan. What's the message there? Have you got that situation under control? After 9-11, 2019 was the most safest year in Pakistan. So after we joined the war on terror uh, on 9-11, uh, from 2000, 2003 onwards, when, uh, when uh, we had such security problems in Pakistan, you know, the investors disappeared, the sports team won't tour Pakistan. But this, I'm happy to say, 2019 was the safest year. We had the least amount of crime since then. And so uh, it was reflected in tourism. In one year, our tourism doubled in 2018 19. Tourism doubled what in changed? Pakistan. Uh, basically, our security forces controlled uh, this uh, uh, the crime, uh, terrorism. They have controlled it. We've, we've also taken a conscious... They've gotten smarter? No, the, the, the security forces paid a huge price. I mean, a lot of sacrifices in controlling uh, the crime. And, you know, uh, there was there, about eight, ten years that we really, the country took a beating. I remember. But we, did, we, we took another step. Uh, we decided that the legacy of 80s where we had created these militant groups to fight the Soviets... These groups had remained after the Soviets had left. Now, uh, before my government, even all the po- political parties in 2015, they took a decision that there would not be any armed militia in Pakistan. And since then, uh, we have disarmed the militias and rehabilitated them. So all that is now reflected in, in the figures. Pakistan has become safe, ready for business. Walk me through the Belt and Road Initiative what that really means for Pakistan, because a lot of critics would say that this is a debt trap for Pakistan. But I know you have a different view. When uh, the Chinese came to help us uh, with this uh, BRI and then the CPAC, which is the Pakistan-China Economic Corridor, uh, we were really at the rock bottom. And so we are really grateful to the Chinese that they came and rescued us. They came as uh, they pumped in uh, uh, even uh, not just uh, they give us loans. And loans, by the way, are not, uh, they're barely 5 or 6% of our total loan po- portfolio, which is uh, the, uh, this nonsense that, you know, Chinese, uh, we are indebted to China. They actually helped us with investment. And, and, and because of them, it has given us an opportunity to attract foreign investment. We've created these special economic zones. We just, we've opened two and we are opening more where we are giving special concessions to industry. And then it's not, it's beyond the, 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 uh, the BRI. In CPAC, they have also, it's technology transfer, especially helping us in agriculture, because Chinese technology, seed development is much better than Pakistan. Our productivity is very low. So, and then skills, they are developing uh, uh, skill centers in Pakistan. So they're, they're really helping us, and we're grateful. When you look at what happens next for Pakistan, obviously there's a great deal of cultural history between Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, and Pakistan and the UAE, and other Gulf nations as well. Um, what role do you believe that your country has to play in that corridor 
of commerce and industry? Because obviously right now, so much concern in the region about what might happen next with Iran. Where do you see the relationship between Pakistan and the Gulf governments going? I repeat, it'll be a disaster for not just Pakistan, the whole area if there's a conflict. Uh, for a start, there are almost 4 million Pakistani workers in UAE and in Saudi Arabia who, spend, uh, who send remittances, which is badly needed because of an imbalance of trade, trade imbalance. Uh, so A, that would be affected. But apart from that, uh, you know, uh, the impact a conflict would have, I repeat, on the oil prices, it just, I mean, it would be a disaster for the whole area. Um, so we are trying our best. I mean, uh, Pakistan plays its part. Uh, you know, we, we, we have a relationship with Iran, with very close relationship with UAE and Saudi Arabia. So we try and we, we've done our best. There were tensions when there were these missile attacks on uh, some oil facility of Saudi Arabia. So we played our part, went to both, I went to both countries uh, and tried to diffuse the tensions. When you think about the economic relationships between Pakistan and the Gulf governments as well, you mentioned the workers, but in terms of trade and other opportunities, where do you see opportunities as yet untouched? Uh, tourism. Pakistan is, is, is one place, you know, it has, it has probably the best mountain tourism in the world because, uh, you know, half of the world's highest peaks, over 24,000 feet, are in Pakistan. Uh, and it is still undiscovered by, by mass tourism. Uh, then it has, it, for religious tourism, we have uh, the holiest shrines of Hinduism, of Sikhism, of, uh, of uh, Buddhism. I mean, the north of Pakistan is, was the center of the Gandhara, Gandhara civilization. And then, of course, uh, Sufism. So that uh, we, are, we are now planning to attract, make it easy for uh, tourists to come And over. you're telling tourists it's safe to come in Pakistan today. As I said, in last one year, tourism doubled in Pakistan. Walk me through your take on this, because I mentioned earlier, celebrity leaders like President Trump, like yourself, you come into office and there is often criticism. You know, this is a person who isn't, you know, a career politician, this person who doesn't come from a traditional background. Are they really going to be able to get it done? It's been interesting to watch the last four years of Donald Trump. Whatever side of the aisle you sit on, whether you love him or hate him, frankly, when it comes to the economy, the president has delivered. Do you believe you're going to be able to deliver for Pakistan? Uh, for, well, let me just uh, correct you. I played uh, professional sport, international cricket for 21 years. Not necessarily years. a traditional background for no, a politician. No, but, no, but I, I'm saying that I played international sports for 21 years, which was a long career. I've been in politics for 23 years. And it was, uh, except for who's the greatest leader of uh, Pakistan ever had, was the great founder of Pakistan. Except for him, I have the longest struggle in politics. So President Trump actually has had an easy ride. He came in, he became president. I, for 22 years, I struggled, built my own party. It's the only time a party has broken through a two-party system. So you fought for this. So uh, a struggle more than sports. I mean, sports was only 21 years. This is 23 years. Are you going to be able to deliver? I think it's the, you know, uh, the struggle which I've been through, which which has which equips me. Basically, the problem we we all face, and leadership faces, how to cope with the bad times. So this has been a very tough time for me. In all my sporting career, I don't think I have ever faced this one year of such problems, uh, taking hard decisions, watching people suffer because because of the hard structural changes. Uh, so it's been a very difficult year for me. But I would not have been able to succeed had I not had that long struggle behind me. On the subject of cricket, Ben Stokes, great cricketer. Yes, he, uh, obviously he is. Uh, I haven't seen much. I must confess, I've hardly seen cricket. <laughs> <laughs> because, You've been too busy. Because, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, issues I've faced, I really haven't watched much cricket. But from, you know, I every not read papers, so he's all, clearly a great cricketer. Excellent work. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, for joining us. Pleasure.